Hi folks, uh, this is Yetmir here today uh, with another episode of Wild Talks. Uh, Yetmir, it's from uh, Škodra, Albania, and today I'm uh, most honored to uh, introduce uh, the well-known wildlife photographer Shannon Wild, currently located in South Africa, where it's very warm. <laughs> Uh, whom uh, gracefully accepted my invitation to be part of this uh, interview. Uh, before we start, I'd like to touch base uh, briefly on her remarkable bio. To begin with, Shannon was born in Australia. She is an iconic figure among professionals. Uh, she is an award-winning wildlife photographer with a true care and passion about nature. Since 2004, uh, to name a few, she has worked with uh, four clients, such as uh, National Geographic, uh, Nat Geo Wild, United Nations, and the list grows very long. In 2017, she founded uh, Wild in Africa Bracelets for Wildlife as a way to directly give back to various wildlife conservation organizations. She has published three books uh, to date, and it's an accomplished international speaker, including the Not Geo Life series. As a former creative director, Shannon has a keen eye for detail and beauty. She gives photographic workshops internationally and is an, an um, ambassador for several conservation charities and foundations. Shannon is active on Instagram. Uh, you can find her at Shannon underscore wild, where she posts frequently and share tips uh, regarding camera settings and uh, behind the scenes. I'm very excited. She is with us today. So here we are. Welcome and great to have you, Shannon. Thank you so much. Yeah, very great to, to connect and I'm excited to revisit uh, some moments in time uh, throughout my career visually. So it's going to be fun. Absolutely. So we have agreed on the structure where essentially will uh, you send me some uh, uh, some of your photos we will go over and essentially will focus on behind the scenes what happened with the photographer <laughs> and everything else that you wish to share, of course. So I'll just go ahead and quickly uh, share the pictures. OK. Let's start with this one, beautiful. Okay, so this is particularly special to me. Um, for those that don't know, this is a pangolin and they're highly endangered and actually one of the most trafficked, uh, illegally trafficked mammals in the world. Um, and it's, it's not a common animal that people know about and it's quite rare to find them in the wild. So. It's something that's been in the back of my mind as this would be an incredibly special animal to see and photograph. But it was one of those things that I kind of never thought would actually happen. Um, and I know field guides, you know, working 20 years in the bush and have never seen a pangolin. So this experience, you know, whether I, I got any images or not, this experience is is definitely up there at the top. And I pride myself on being able to stay very professional and focused during my shoots. But I will say this is one time where I, I did the shoot and I got through the shoot. Uh, we had a very short amount of time because as you can see, it's dusk. The, the light was fading very quickly. And actually they're pretty fast moving. So they eat uh, like termites and ants. So you'll mm -hmm. see um, in, in the side of frame, there's like a little termite hill. So he, he was basically like running between termite hills and digging away. So actually very fast and hard to keep up with. Um, so I had this very short amount of time to shoot. And once the light had gone mm. and I stopped and and kind of took in what had just happened and that I had had seen one so close, got to photograph it, I literally started crying and I've never oh, done that yeah. with anything before. And I've, I've had some incredible experiences, but this was just so 
it was an experience I never thought that I would have. So such a beautiful and interesting animal. So yeah, this is a very special picture to me. Among uh, many reasons uh, uh, to be excited about this interview, it's also uh, the images that you bring uh, are folks uh, usually photograph in Europe and that's the photos that we usually comment and discuss. So having a different perspective as such, it's, it's so exciting. So thank you for that as well. Uh, should we move on the second uh, image? Yeah. Yep, beautiful. <laughs> so this is quite recent uh, and possibly the most recent shot in the ones that I've given you. Um, I haven't obviously been working quite as much recently given uh, the world situation, um, but this uh, I shot recently for a Nikon campaign for their new mirrorless camera, the Z9. Uh -huh. And so it was a great experience to have a play with that camera, which was amazing. Um, and I'm so sad that I had to give it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is one of the favorite uh, photographs that I shot from that campaign. And I mean, there's a, there's a few reasons why, and obviously the first being the subject, so cute when you have baby cheetah. And <clears throat> I, I hadn't ever photographed cheetah before young enough to still have that full body mohawk on their back. Mm -hmm. So I was really happy to see that. They're so cute. Um, and also the lighting, I mean, oh you know part of being a wildlife photographer is is choosing when we shoot and that's usually early morning late afternoon that's when the best uh, and usually most interesting light is um but that doesn't mean you're going to a find the animals and b that they're going to do anything interesting uh for you so this is um like a nice combination of of all those things so their mother had just started walking off um away and so this is right before they were about to follow her off into the distance. And I was, you know, very slowly and quietly approaching, but they obviously knew that I was there. Um, and as I just slowly sort of started to crouch down to get a lower angle, um, they both looked at the same time, which was oh. really sweet, um, before turning and running. And I love that you can see how individual these two are so they're from the same litter they're the same age but they're so different looking like you know the one on um, the left of frame is quite a uh, I don't know the sexes but she has quite a feminine mm -hmm. face a smaller face whereas the one on the right is quite you know quite a wide face so even at this age you can start telling individuals apart so yeah that was special that's awesome. I have to stop the picture. It's quite amazing in all levels. I mean, you just connect with it. Oh, you thank you. With that experience and having you talking about that, it's just an addition uh, uh, joy. Uh, but I have to stop quickly to Z9 you mentioned. We have three friends yes. uh, who actually <laughs> pre-ordered it. <laughs> we have Stefan. You're not from, going to regret it. <laughs> right. So I'm glad you mentioned it. We have Stefan mm. from Germany, Harold from Austria, and Valian. Uh, uh, from Northern Macedonia, they all pre-ordered it. So they are very excited. We, they've been watching videos, but having somebody who yeah. really actually worked mm. with it is amazing. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, I'm also excitedly waiting uh, for mine. Um, yeah, it's incredibly responsive. So as a wildlife photographer, mm. when you, there are so many things out of your control. Um, they're having equipment that helps support you know, your vision and uh, allowing you to focus on the creative elements of your shots and it taking care of the technical side. So, um, you know, really nailing focus, super responsive. So I was very, very impressed with it. And like I said, very sad that I had to send it back. <laughs> I had a prototype. Um, so it was pre-production model. Um, so right my understanding is that it's uh you know even better now to be oh, actually released to market yeah. so right. yeah very impressive very nice <laughs> all right uh here we go let's go to the next one awesome uh also one of 
I mean, obviously I sent you favorites, so I'm going to probably <laughs> say that about everything. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you. But I'm a huge reptile lover, so subject-wise, it's a big, you know, tick for me. But Madagascar is one of my favorite places mm. on earth, and I'm so fortunate that I get to live in Africa and that it's actually relatively close, so I've been mm. there uh, many times. Um, and this particular location, you know, some of your viewers may recognize it's quite an iconic place in Madagascar. So it's uh, Baobab Alley. Um, so there's been many, many photographs of it over the uh, years. And so for me, my motivation is, is wildlife and having an animal subject. So I love the location, but I need something else in the shot to make it really mm -hmm. For me um, so this was a wide angle shot and I thought it was the perfect opportunity to do an environmental shot mm -hmm. and I was fortunate enough to while there see this is a giant Malagasy chameleon so he's quite big actually um, sort of maybe gosh mm -hmm. pretty big um, so this is this dirt road actually has like a lot of um, like horse and carts going over it. It has a lot of tourist vehicles kind of rushing by. So I laid down on, on the road to get this shot. Obviously, I want to get as low as possible. I want to kind of get in as much as the environment, uh, but have the main focus on the chameleon. Um, and then after I, uh, I have a sequence of, of shots from here, but then after that, I actually uh, took it off the road because there's so many things kind of zooming past um, and I uh, put it on the other side of the road in the direction that was heading but yeah such a, a special moment and I I'm trying to think of um, what year it was gosh mm -hmm. It was a while ago. I, go I might fat, even have it in my <laughs> file name. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I need to get back to Madagascar. This is but like making me something. Something I know. <laughs> something I want to ask country. you. Yeah, on the, this is the third uh, shot, and I see in uh, environmental inclusion, if you will, on the frame. Is that something that happened? Uh, during your creative process through years or was that something that you will always attach to like also including a little bit of environment background and you know it's usually a mix because i do have a lot of images that are are tighter or longer okay. focal lengths and so you know tighter shots mm -hmm. um so it could be partly that's just by nature of what i've chosen to share today i definitely have a lot of that um, but there, there are certain situations where I feel like it's really an important part of the story, um, or depending on context, what the opportunity presented. So, mm. I mean, obviously it being Baobab Alley, I've put a wide angle lens on to take this shot, um, because I have a lot of chameleon shots, not this particular species, but a lot of chameleon shots that are with longer focal lengths so you know have a nice separation and the background is fully out of focus right. and so you don't have that much context of where it is it could be anywhere mm -hmm. um and i feel like for this location that would be um a waste of of the environment because it's such a right. unique and special right. place yeah and then certainly for the pangolin i i was really trying to capture the sky because it was so beautiful at the time. So it really depends on context, right. but I will often shoot a mix. And I, I like working with zoom lenses so that I have flexibility in mm. the moment. And so I can take a variety of shots from uh, sort of wider to, you know, tighter. Yeah, and I, and I really like the perspectives that you bring. And I guess when you have an experience, you have that muscle uh, of making decisions so quickly. You understand what's going yeah. on, and you make decisions maybe really fast. A lot of us are they get we get so excited about seeing a subject. We, you know, yeah. we may forget <laughs> sometimes 
that there are other things, but when you have a trained eye such as yourself, you start making quicker decisions, better decisions. And I, I, I guess- Yeah, and I, I think also that can happen with the technical side of things. So if you're mm. just starting out in photography, it can be very overwhelming um, trying to think about all the things that you're supposed to think about, all the settings you're, you're doing. And as time goes on and with experience, that kind of falls away and it becomes more intuitive. And so right. the beauty of that is once you become so familiar with uh, your gear and the fundamentals of photography and exposure and, you know, what everything does, then it allows you to really focus on what you're seeing through the frame, how you're framing and composing those shots and maybe letting you be a bit more creative in that because um, I remember, I mean, I've been shooting professionally for 18 years, but I remember what it was like when I was so overwhelmed at the beginning when I didn't have a fully yet understanding of everything. And so you're questioning a lot of things and then add to that a subject that is constantly moving or you can't direct it it just they do what they do um, adds another layer of challenge so it's something that definitely um, gets easier with time right and like you said it does it becomes intuitive um, even the 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 way that I shoot and the way that I frame especially is also very intuitive so I'm not necessarily logically thinking about it I'm seeing and feeling it through the viewfinder and I'll obviously um, try to take as much variety as I can in a shot um, and then if there's a situation where the subject is going to be around for a while and I've I've got the safe shots out of the way and safe um, you know I don't mean necessarily mediocre but certainly uh, maybe from a like technical perspective mm -hmm. I have those shots out of the way then if the subject is still there, then it's going to allow me to try some riskier things. Like maybe I'm playing with a slow shutter speed or, right. you know, purposeful motion blur or, you know, just start to, to have some fun rather than duplicating what I've already captured. Real cool, real cool. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think it's very beneficial for many folks, uh, depending where we are. So that's great. Mm. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh. Uh. <laughs> also it. one of my favorites, <laughs> yes. And I often get asked if this is a like composited image, um, which I don't, I don't do. So I, I don't have anything against it, but I'm, I'm not one that, you know, combines images or, you know, is is taking things out and putting in or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so this is where I feel like moments like this, it's it's so much more rewarding because I I'm not like pasting it all together. Um, so this is in South Africa. This is a white rhino, um, and a very special subject to me. And and the area that I live in, it's um, I'm so fortunate that I there are rhino around. I mean, not, you know, they're generally in protected areas, mm -hmm. uh, but we do have a major issue here with poaching. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a constant um, reminder of how fragile life is when you get to see um, rhino in the wild. And um, it's just nice that I was able to get into a position that's uh, like a low perspective, which is, I love shooting from a low perspective. Um, and that I had a moody sky to work with and not like a really awful blown out sky. So that's, you know, a few of those things coming together. And then with the, the birds, so basically they're foraging for insects that the, the rhino disturbs as it walks. So they're constantly following rhino and buffalo um, in the hopes of some free meals. So they're usually mm -hmm. around. And it just happened that um, in this shot, I did a sequence of shots. Um, and as I was looking through the viewfinder, I saw the birds come in, but I didn't see that I'd got this 
kind of sequence um, until like after it had all happened nice. and I looked and it's one of the few times I've looked at my screen and actually like squealed out loud. <laughs> So yeah, let's, sure. um, yeah. It's, <laughs> I mean, cause it looks like, it looks like the sequence of flight of one bird, but it's actually three separate birds and it's just, mm -hmm. it's nice how it's, uh, it's worked out there. So yeah. yeah and it's, cool. this, I was just going to say this, if I've ever done um, uh, photographic workshops and stuff like that, this is a prime example of an image where, um, there are there is that factor of luck involved absolutely mm. but it's it's where you can be you have to be out there so you have to actually go out and look for scenes and look for wildlife to to produce that luck um so i definitely encourage people to to get out and just spend your time out there because the more you know familiar with your gear that you are when scenes like this happen uh you're ready to capture it because you've got the the experience and the tools and the knowledge to do it so you can make the best of that luck happening in front of you that's right that's right so uh i looked at on your instagram i think uh it's mentioned that you have this file on different size printings and stuff and something came up mm. to mind uh, and some, uh, and here's a good moment, I think, to ask a question that came out from my viewers as well. Regarding printing, uh, what do you usually, when you save them as prints, because like, it seems that most of us right now, they are just doing the images and posting them on web, but we forget that it's a big part of our photography. It's also uh, printing in frames or, you know, different uh, ways. So when you are, mm. when, uh, so if we can talk briefly about printing, very briefly with a, yeah. how do you, yeah, like, absolutely. How, how do you save it? Can you tell us a little, some tips perhaps about printing? Uh, sure. What, what, like file extensions, uh, the DPI, yeah. things like that, that we should keep in, in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the benefits I have is that before I picked up a camera, I was a graphic designer and my first job was at a printer. Um, so I have this very print focused foundation and very composition driven foundation. Um, so the way that I approach every image and any editing is always from a print mind, whether it's going to end up there or not. Um, so I'm always shooting raw and then I will work the file. So, you know, it's Lightroom now when I started Lightroom, uh, obviously didn't exist um, but I will always work on uh, a non-destructive format so the beauty of Lightroom is that it is referencing my raw file but I'm not actually changing the raw file um, so I'll do my edits and when I export for print or generally what I'll do is export a few different versions so if it's something like Instagram, I'll still export a JPEG that's quite big resolution just because um, they seem to compress better once they are posted to Instagram, whatever their algorithm for compression is. Mm -hmm. If you start with an already sort of smaller compressed image, it doesn't seem to look very good. Uh, so I will generally export uh, for for online, a JPEG um, at about 70% quality or like a seven on the scale, uh, maybe eight. Um, and for printing, it really depends on the printer. So mm. I use different printers. Um, and when I say this, I mean print houses. I don't print myself. Um, you know, for fine art, I'll, I'll put that out to a print house. So they sometimes have different requirements uh, depending on the place or the country that I'm using. Uh, so generally, if you want like a really nice quality print file, uh, I'm trying to keep the, the file at 16 bits. Mm -hmm. um, I will export it as a TIFF at uh, 300 DPI 
there are some printers that requested at 240. So that can be a conversation as needed. Um, but generally 300 DPI, you're pretty safe. And with something like, especially the black and white, if I'm exporting the TIFF at 16 bit at that full resolution, it's going to carry across all that tonal information really nicely. Um, what the printer does with that file to get it as a, as a format for their printer, I don't know. So I don't know if they need to change it down to 8-bit or whatnot, but there are some printers that it has to be a high resolution JPEG. So by default, it is, has to be an 8-bit file. So what you'll find is you don't even have to worry about that side of things. Like if you're exporting from Lightroom and you export as a JPEG, just do it at the absolute highest um, quality as possible. So put your slider all the way up to it's like 10 or 12 or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so the compression is minimal and that will still give you a great uh, quality print file. The, the key of understanding files and JPEG especially is to not then go back to that JPEG file, open it, do some edits, then save it again. So you've basically, JPEG is a format that is, is kind of finding ways to minimize the file size. Mm -hmm. And so if you save over that JPEG with another JPEG, every time you do that, it's removing information from that file to make it a more efficient file size. Um, so that's why something like a Lightroom where you keep all your base files and your editing. If you need to go back, edit in Lightroom or whatever you need to do, but then export from that original like high resolution file again, if possible. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Very, uh, a lot of substance. I, I appreciate that, that's yeah. wonderful. Because there are things that sometimes they, they just don't mention it, but I think these yeah. are details that as you grow as a photographer, it, it comes a point that, you know, you might want to print something. So I think that goes absolutely long way, that knowledge. So that's awesome. Very good. Yeah. And I think I'm quite fortunate because I had that experience and skills before getting into photography in that I had to work and prepare other people's files and images and, and that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's very handy. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. All right, here are we, um, we're in a different place here. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're up to the Arctic. Uh, so this is my first trip to the Arctic and I've been very fortunate to go a few times and I used to run um, photographic expeditions up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but this is my very, very first trip. We, I was on an icebreaker and we had literally got as far as that ship could go into pack ice and that was kind of it and we decided to stay there overnight before we would back the ship out and kind of continue our journey um and so it's summertime still obviously very cold but it means there's 24 hour sunlight um so of course the polar bear comes at about 2 a.m when we're trying to sleep <laughs> but this polar bear the the beautiful thing is that because we're in pack ice you can literally see for kilometers so this bear was spotted very far off as a little dot so we had plenty of time to prepare as uh, as he approached and kind of made his way and he ended up spending a few hours around the ship circling it smelling investigating and the way the ship had gone into the ice some of the edge of the ice at the front had kind of pushed up against the side of the ship and so at one point he came up um, and was sort of investigating the side of the ship it's too high for him to get on otherwise I wouldn't probably be here <laughs> but it was very very curious um, so I laid down on the deck of the ship and you know I was shooting through like a hole where they have ropes through or the water can uh, go out so I was working with a 70 to 200 mil lens mm -hmm. yeah. and um, I had had it so that the end of the lens was just sort of in that hole um, so that I wasn't you know physically outside of the ship 
which is not good practice. Um, so I made sure, you know, that wasn't quite out there so I didn't lose my lens or a lens cap or whatever. Um, and literally as I'm looking through the viewfinder, this polar bear had got onto this elevated piece of ice stood up on its hind legs and just like came up into frame and so we're face to face like a few feet apart mm -hmm. is a few feet in front of my lens so this is not a it's not cropped it's how how I shot it um and mm. yeah definitely a special moment and I love to shoot very shallow and so um that will become a theme in my work. So depending on the shots and, you know, unless it was environmental, I do like to shoot very, very shallow. So in this particular shot, I just have his nose where it's just like what was like right up into my lens there. So, yeah. And then behind it is just the pack ice that just flat mm -hmm. for as far as we could see. So, yeah, that was a really uh, special experience. And I have a, I have so many photos because he stayed around for so long. Yeah. I have, and I think I might have included another polar bear image, and it'll be from this same bear, um, which I wanted to include because I shot it with my phone, and I I wanted to show something where you don't necessarily need all the high end equipment, right. mm -hmm. and in this particular case, the bear was too close for the lens that I had. So I had my phone on me, obviously. So I took the opportunity and that actually turned out being one of my most popular images. So, yeah, I think I threw that in, hopefully for good measure, now that I've said it. <laughs> I'll have to see. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, uh, the first trip, the first time that I went to the Arctic was definitely my best in terms of polar bear sightings and, and content that I got out of it. So um, I was able to film this uh, scene as well. So as it was approaching, I have footage of him walking along and like sticking his tongue out and ah. just doing all interesting things. So yeah, it was a magical, magical experience. Such a beautiful animal. Uh, from uh, it is an amazing shot. It's you just connect with it, and I see it, and I see where the focus point is as well, and which is beautiful. And then you just dive in through this. Some, uh, very majestic stop, yeah. creature, if you will. Uh, it's amazing. So, from that perspective, uh, from the compositional perspective, um, it, with respect to where subjects is in the frame, you read many articles where they have different perspectives on where how you should treat subject based where and um, and even the uh, the the way you cut it, like, where do you stand? How do you see, like, what's your take on the composition yeah. when it comes to subject versus where in frames and, and how? So I, I utilize composition a lot and I feel like it's one of the dominant factors in my work um, other than, you know, shooting very shallow and also mm -hmm. like very vibrant color, if it's a color image, um, you know, with composition, I, I love using negative space. Um, and I've definitely showcased that in images as we go along. But in this case, um, I was just in the moment trying to find balance in how I shot it. I shot it a few different ways. I have a few different uh, options and versions. Um, I also have it kind of looking up and his nose going this way and the other. So what I tend to do is I'm constantly moving uh, my gear around and reframing my shot and getting variety of shots. So hmm. this was, um, I don't, I less to do with me trying to get it in a rule of thirds per se and trying to find, I think, intuitive balance on where I place the head and the focus. Mm. And I would often love to, you know, create plenty of negative space above his head. But in this particular shot, it would have become uh, quite bottom heavy if he was, I feel like if he was further down. So, but I still don't want to have him closer to the top because I want there to be like that little bit of breathing space as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like to use, 
so if I have a subject that I'm deciding to shoot negative space and it is looking this way, by default, my natural reaction is to give it space to look into, into that picture. Mm. So I will allow space where it's looking. But mm. what I've also learned um, in my career is that if you want to, you can really engage a viewer by creating tension in a photo. So that is my default. That is what I will be my safe shot and I will frame it that way. Mm -hmm. But if I have the opportunity, then I'll also try to reframe my shot. So it's still looking the same way, but I'm putting the negative space on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, later I can decide which I find is the more powerful image, or maybe it's an end application where say you're selling your images for stock and that is the better option for, you know, a magazine layout or, you know, for whatever the story might be. Um, but I find it re found it really interesting to purposefully create tension, even though that's not the, the intuitive or maybe even the um, going by the rule book of, you know, right. allowing space to look into it. You definitely don't want to crop subjects so much that it's, mm -hmm you're kind of ruining the image where it's too tight but if you you can start to play with that purposefully for sure and you know it's a creative outlet so you know experiment um i think learn your rules of composition understand why they work and why they're important um but then play and experiment um and one of the things that i i think is quite helpful, especially for beginners, if they're not quite sure what's going to make a great composition in this particular moment, is to shoot a bit wider. And then once you have it in Lightroom, start playing with all the different options of how it could be cropped. And then you will quickly start to learn uh, what is the most, you know, what makes for a powerful image. And you'll start to do that in camera as you see it in the viewfinder and you know you can move your frame around and see okay that's the that's the most powerful in this scene or that's how it would be you know balanced and shot and now I'm going to shoot it you know three different other ways because I've got time to do that and now I have options at the end as well so it's something I think that comes and becomes part of that intuition mm. um, you know along with your settings absolutely and uh, coming back to this shot as you're speaking, I'm like drawn into the shot because you are there and this amazing bear. And I think what you're describing is really happening. There is almost an intense connection, an intimidating element between uh, the subject, in this case, the bear and the viewer that you just feel overpowered. Yeah. But that emotion, it's happening without you acknowledging it per se. And then you catch yourself <laughs> in that moment and I think that's very amazing I mean the way you you've and done it that's why I'm always I'm, wondering yeah what they're thinking you know especially mm -hmm. if you get a shot where there's eye contact with the the subject yeah. I'm thinking you know they must yeah. be thinking what a strange situation that I have this yeah. big <laughs> eye like looking at me <laughs> yeah. that's right well okay yeah awesome yeah. very unique and different uh I can't wait to see what else is there. So let's just go. <laughs> oh, I forgot what I sent you. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so oh. many stories. Um, so, oh. gosh. So this, this image, basically, this animal and this image represents about 18 months of my life. Um, mm -hmm. I filmed a documentary for National Geographic on this particular a melanistic leopard, so what we call a black panther. Um, and so I moved to India for 18 months to film this documentary. And uh, so I was living in this little shack on the edge of the jungle in southwest India and basically went out every day looking for this particular cat to film um, enough to make a compelling one hour documentary. Um, which we eventually did. And uh, I think it's coming out in the US soon, if not now. Um, but yeah, very, I mean, so 
I went into this project, uh, the bulk of my work these days is filming. So I generally am not taking a stills camera. I don't have time. If, if I see this cat, I have to be filming it. I have to be capturing footage to make this documentary because it is such a rare and elusive animal that we needed that whole 18 months to kind of get enough uh, stuff. And we could have easily spent another year or two just tracking him and trying to make this documentary. So it was not a situation where I could be like, oh, we have a Black Panther sighting, amazing. I'm going to take stills for myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is one of the, I feel like, it is like the only picture. <laughs> I think I've got a few in this sequence, but right. literally the only time I took a photograph um, of him. And yeah, usually I'm, I'm trying to film him. Um, and he's, it was the hardest project of my life. It was mm -hmm. so amazing. This forest is, is so thick. And this is dry season. So it's mm -hmm. this beautiful amber color, uh, but it gets very lush and very thick in the wet season. And just, you know, he made us really, really work for it. Mm -hmm. He is the only melanistic leopard in this massive uh, forest. And leopard are elusive anyway. Um, so the fact that we're trying to build a whole documentary on one individual, whereas mm -hmm. quite often in wildlife documentaries, unless it's a specific individual, you're shooting possibly multiple individuals of the species that the story can then be cut together and create right, this, right. um, you know, this storyline. Uh, but obviously we can't do that here. So we're constantly going and looking for him and, you know, trying to um guess where he's going to be um being based in africa i'm used to working here and how we track animals and usually that's a lot of uh, looking at the ground and looking for you know paw prints mm -hmm. and um you know other signs and tracks uh definitely alarm calls but not not quite as much whereas in india this forest was so thick and this is one of the few areas where he kind of popped out into the open. But in general, it's like so dense that you can't, I mean, you look at the ground he's walking on, he's not leaving any tracks. There's, it's not dirt or anything like that. So we can't follow, you know, these paw prints. So we basically went over and had to learn all these different alarm calls. So what a monk, the monkey, the langurs there, what their alarm call sounds like if right. it's, if it's a leopard, it's a different call if it's a tiger because they still alarm call, but the tiger can't go up the tree and get them. So it's a different level of alarm call, whereas the leopards could actually, you know, obviously go up and hunt them. So it was a more dramatic call. Um, and then you had all these just general contact calls. Uh, and then, you know, we had to listen for um, different birds alarm calling. And there was this one bird that sounded like the monkey alarm call so if you hear it like far away in the distance I would hear this bird but I think it's an alarm call and I'm like oh it's over there like something, something moving I don't know if it's a tiger I don't know if it's a leopard or this wow. leopard um, but you know let's it might be there and then I realize it's this bird that I I just keep getting confused with the monkey <laughs> so annoying but I think after I think it took me three or four months to oh. really like get used to it, like the distinction between these calls and also learn this forest. So uh, there's a series of little um, dirt roads through this forest. And so it took a good three months for me to become familiar with even what region of the, the forest that I was in. Um, and then you start to learn his general behavior and movements, um, you know, if, if I last saw him go into this dense part of the forest, maybe there's like water over here. Maybe he's going for that. And so it's educated guesses along the way, but very much guesses. So yeah, yeah. we definitely needed all the time we could to, to get this. But uh, I love this in particular because even though 
to me, this light is kind of harsh and it's outside, possibly just outside of the hours that I would normally shoot. Mm -hmm. um, it was perfect for him in this situation because it can show you his spots. So it shows you that he is a leopard. Uh, because as soon you can see the shadow from his head onto his shoulder, it's just pitch black. So as soon as he moves into shade or the sun dips a little bit, he just becomes a black silhouette. Mm -hmm. And you can't actually see those um, incredible spots on him. So, yeah. Um, also very tricky for focusing systems to find. Uh, but as because it's just this black solid chunk, um, but with wildlife filming, we always uh, film and focus manually. So, okay. but even doing that, it made it very difficult because we utilize what's called peaking, which I'm sure some people are familiar with because you can get that on your, um, you know, your Sony and different cameras where it, it shows you the edge and if it's in focus. So basically we use that in filming um, to give us an idea to make sure we're hitting the focus and then we track and move that focus as the animal moves. So it can become very difficult, but I found that the, the peaking, it just really struggled with finding if he was in focus or even like what he was compared to background, especially when it was, um, he spends a lot of time in shadows and that's how he uh, hunts and also how he avoids excess heat because he is fully black he absorbs the heat more than the normal colored leopard so he can't spend as much time out in the sun so it was all these things that uh, made a very very challenging uh, project but I'm glad I actually took a still photo of him because uh, otherwise it's all footage <laughs> Such an amazing uh, background story, if you will. And uh, definitely we look forward to uh, see uh, the documentary. Yeah. And uh, I guess it just being able to discuss with you before that comes out, I think it's exciting within itself. So thank you so much. And one, every photo also have a unique story and the way you uh, express us is truly engaging. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank I can't you. wait to see also what's what else is it's like a box of gems. I, it's so <laughs> fun to relive these moments. <laughs> so cool. cool. Okay, let's should we go or should we move of uh, yeah? Forward? No, it's some oh that eye. Oh. So another moment where I was really thinking, what is he thinking? So this is a silverback <laughs> gorilla. So he was the, um, the, the dominant gorilla in the family that uh, I'd obviously trekked to go find. So right. what was interesting about this is gorillas have always been so high on my bucket list. So this was another very special moment. And knowing how endangered they are, and feeling like there was potentially a time limit on this opportunity. I was very conscious of that. Uh, what added another layer of challenge to this particular shoot uh, is that, <laughs> so when I was in India, so referencing the previous mm -hmm. image, while I was on that shoot, I broke my back. Um, and so by the time I got to this shoot, and I was having to trek through the jungle. Um, I, I think I'd had my injury for maybe two years and I hadn't recovered still very well. I was on a lot of painkillers and trying to check through. Uh, this is um, Bwindi Impenetrable Forest. So it's an app name because it's very thick um, in Uganda. And oh my goodness. So just I'm just remembering like literally the pain of like trying to get there. Um, so I think challenges. I trekked, <laughs> so there was a few hours trekking oh, wow. um, and we found this family and it was just, it was so magical because, you know, with, with the gorillas and while they are accustomed, you know, they've been specifically accustomed to, to people coming Um you have like a time limit of spending an hour with them. 
And what was really so beautiful and natural about this particular family is, you know, they just get on with their day and what they're doing. So we, we found them, we came across them, they keep uh, grazing and, and just doing their thing and interacting with each other. It's actually very fortunate that this uh, silverback actually mated with a female while we were there, which was an incredible experience um, and very eye opening. <laughs> I won't go into detail. Um, yeah. And so this is literally him laying down after the act. And he's like, oh, so worn out. I'm going to rest now because my life is so hard. <laughs> and, um, and so I, you know, was moving around and trying to get a few different um, angles. And, and obviously you have to work with the forest because it's so mm -hmm. thick and it's, there's always like a branch, you know, in your way. But you have to be quite conscious of not getting too close and not disturbing them from what they're doing. Um, and not interrupting uh, their natural mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, and so as this hour that we were allowed to be in their presence kind of came to the end, they as a family actually just started to move off quite naturally. So mm -hmm. it was really kind of nice because we could just sort of sit and, you know, our time is up. So we let them move off into the forest and that's kind of like, okay, bye you're amazing <laughs> and then and then knowing we have to trek back and so how much I'm hating my life when I do that so <laughs> yeah. yeah and I have to say the trek going back was so much harder it was shorter but um because obviously we're with trained professional guides in the forest that are familiar with the gorilla they're familiar with the forest because I would 100% get lost mm. um so as you're looking for gorillas, you're kind of moving around and going different ways because they're getting feedback of, of where they last saw them and maybe mm -hmm. if they're heading in this direction from other guides. But when you go to trek back to sort of base camp, they're trying to take you essentially the quickest way. And the quickest way just happens to be kind of like this. So I thank goodness you know you have the stick where you're like trekking along like proper trek I am literally like digging the stick in and yanking myself up this hill I uh, I have a heart condition as well so I'm literally there like uh, uh, I'm so unfit I really need to work out my back hurts but uh, you're a hero yeah. to do it with in this type of conditioning oh my god you know I oh I sh it was it was too soon after my injury that I logically should have been doing it, but it was one mm. of those things where the opportunity presented and I'm like gorilla bucket list. I am not missing this opportunity. So yeah, totally worth it. Yeah, it was, I mean, the shot, <laughs> everything you said, there is a lot of worth to it, but definitely the challenge you described, they just go beyond. I mean, it's just, it's really, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. <laughs> Yeah, there's been definitely um, uh, some challenges mm. along this adventure for sure. Right. Awesome. Uh, should we should be uh, hear the, the next story? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. Madagascar again. Yeah. I love 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 Madagascar. Uh, so this, uh, I. I went to Madagascar kind of hoping for this shot and mm -hmm. having seen other photographers, um, you know, capture this behavior. And so it was definitely like fist pump moment when, when it was all over. So this is a, a safaka and the way that their body is designed, it, it's for tree living. So their hips are, are kind of, facing a way that doesn't allow them to really like crawl like a monkey, like you would mm. be used to seeing a monkey. So they actually have to do like this little dance to go between trees. So essentially it's a hop and it's like focusing on one side and then they hop to the other side and then the other side. So they're back and forth, back and forth. Um, and so in this situation, there were a few safaka that were crossing this dirt road. So 
I could see them kind of making their way to this area and knowing that they do this behavior I basically ran ahead and I'm laying down on the ground again and trying to get nice and low so that um, you know that background kind of falls away nicely and I don't mm -hmm. have just full dirt so if I'm standing up and looking down then the background perspective is just going to be that dirt road but I want to include the trees and and you know, have some interest in the background, even though I'm going to put it out of focus. Um, and I was very fortunate because there were two Safakas that, that came and did this. So I have a sequence of images of them in different, um, you know, strides and different processes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, this is actually fairly low light. From memory, I was only very much from memory but maybe only one five hundredth of a second so considerably slow for an action shot but this is you can see the light coming through so it's in full shade pretty much um and so it's one of those things where you have to find the balance in where you're prepared to um compromise depending on your gear and how familiar you are with it. So that's like, how far do I want to push my ISO um, to get the, the shutter speed? So I was fairly comfortable with uh, 500th of a second because, you know, they're not, it's not like cheetah fast. They're kind of like hop, hop, hop. So it's, okay. yeah, it's action, see. but it was enough to, to freeze it and not have to, so I'm shooting, the, the lowest aperture that I possibly could for the lens that I was on, which I'm struggling to remember, but okay. most yeah. likely um, the Tamron 150 to 600. Right. Um, so a really uh, versatile zoom length mm -hmm. there. The payoff with that uh, lens, which I do use that lens a lot, is that it's not um, a super fast lens. So I can't shoot at 2.8 or F4. Um, the minimum is 5.3 right. up to, I think, 6.7 as the, as the minimum if you're fully extended at 600. Right. So that is very much dictating my aperture. I am absolute lowest aperture that I can because I want uh, that background to fall away and that to be the focus on, on this guy. Um, and then... The other compromise is, and I do not remember what my ISO was, but I've, I've obviously set a limit on to where I'm happy for that to go up to based on um, the camera that I'm shooting on, which at this point could have been a D800 maybe from memory. Okay. Um, I don't remember what ISO I was shooting at, but I do remember that the 500th, I didn't want to go below 500th of a second, mm -hmm. but I wasn't wasn't willing to push my ISO any higher and my aperture was dictated for me by the lens mm -hmm. in that I know I want it as low as possible. So, uh, and that aperture was also dictated because it's not a fixed aperture, it's dictated by where the zoom is. So as I'm working, I'm constantly zooming in and out, I'm framing my shot. So I have it set that it's on the lowest aperture, but as I barrel out, that aperture is obviously going up and up and up to meet um, the minimum that it can be for that focal length. And then as I barrel back in, it lowers mm -hmm. back down. So in that particular case, I'm shooting in aperture priority mode because that is my primary focus. I want that to be the thing that I really control, obviously shutter because I'm freezing action. Um, but aperture priority because I want to make sure that that aperture stays as absolutely low. So if I barrel back out and shoot wider, I want to make sure it follows me back. Um, whereas I could have set that as a static and knowing I think that it went to 6.7 fully extended, um, I could have set it at 6.7. And then the only thing is if I'd have barreled back, I want to be shooting at 5.3 if I can possibly get any shallower, right. if I decide to shoot that slightly wider. So for me, aperture is a very yep. much priority um, as well as, as shutter speed. But as long as I'm working with sort of a minimum shutter speed 
anything over that I know is, you know, depending on the animal, isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. It's the aperture that for me is the priority because that's very much a creative decision that mm. dictates my style of work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, today, I mean, I see that with 500 uh, shutter speed, uh, 500 of a second, it's a very nice freeze. I can, you know, especially the upper body, it's very, it's very nicely uh, framed. Uh, uh, it's definitely frozen. And, and by the way, uh, 150 to 600, uh, the G2 lens, I think that's Yes. Yeah. Uh, that it's very. I use it a lot. I used it. I used it. I loved. I personally loved it. I think it was. Yeah, they did a mm. good job. And and uh, but definitely. It's so this, versatile. This comes a moment that we had a conversation uh, in the, in the group with the guys and and it seems that a conversation that it's uh, like Zoom versus Prime. Mm. Uh, yeah, it can be very uh, polarizing <laughs> because. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people like Prime only. Mm, mm, um, mm, mm. And, you know, without being offensive to anyone, that can absolutely work if, if you have the time to be constantly changing lenses and maybe your life, <laughs> uh, like your, your work and your income or your deadlines don't depend on you getting I mean, the shot. So, you know what I mean? Like yeah. at the end of the day, Very I reasonable. have to get results because it's yeah. my job. Yeah. Um, so if it was a hobby and the pressure was off, but then of course it's, you know, then you start saying, can I justify prime prices yeah. if it's only my hobby? Cause yikes, you're paying for something. And it's like that, that separation and the speed and the quality of those lenses, you're paying for a reason because they're incredible. Right. Um, they're also heavier. Mm. Uh, and if I'm in situations where, you know, I don't, often get a second chance at what's happening in front of me and so often I am stuck on a vehicle in a position that that cannot be moved because it might disturb the animal so I'm then limited of how close or how far I can get but it might be my assignment that I have to get a variety of shots so and I might not have the time so if I if I knew I had the time and I had, you know, a variety of prime lenses and I do have, absolutely do have prime lenses, mm -hmm. but I find myself reaching for the zooms because I want flexibility. So I'm constantly reframing my shots. I'm constantly zooming in and out. I'm constantly changing my composition. I never use a monopod. I'd never use a tripod unless I'm filming. So all these things come into play and as does um, my size, I'm quite small. And so I don't want to work on a tripod or a monopod. So I need to be able to physically lift and hold this gear up to my face and be able to work all day. So these are all factors that come into play when you have to do it every day for a living. So you seem to start going for grabbing for things that are going to make your day easier work, while still producing yeah. results as well so in a perfect world i would have shot this on a 400 mil prime or a 600 mil prime mm -hmm. um i feel like i probably wouldn't have been able to run in position carrying that lens <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe couldn't have shot at 1 500th because i'd be shaking so much trying to um, support it um and i do i will say i do shake a little bit so that always comes into play with my shutter speed and right. um, what minimum shutter speed I'm comfortable with using depending on the focal length. Um, so yeah, these are all factors. But uh, if I had have shot this, say at 2.8, which just would have been absolute magic, uh, um, like I said, a four or 600 mil prime, that background would have been delightful no <laughs> yeah. question it would be delightful but the chances of me getting the shot would have been very, slim. very much gone down yeah yeah <laughs> because i'm probably already like 
back at camp because I can't carry it anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, I, it depends on, on what, um, you know, the, the project is um, and what the subject is and how, you know, if I, I know that I'm going to be in a vehicle all day and I am not physically having to carry every lens with me. Um, this, on the other hand, I'm trekking. And so I'm carrying everything physically. Uh, on me um, so that very much dictates what I'm going to take with me awesome yeah Matt, thank you for the perspective it, to me it makes a lot of sense as of why which when <laughs> exactly yeah I mean like I said I led expeditions uh, photographic expeditions um, to the arctic mm. and you know, I've had uh, people come along and I, I distinctly remember a guy coming along with a 600 mil prime. Um, but the problem is, so obviously then he has it attached to a monopod uh, because you need to be able to support it somehow. Um, but the tricky thing is we're getting from an icebreaker and we're climbing down a little ladder off the side of a ship into a Zodiac, so a blow up boat to then photograph from that little boat or going to shore and then trekking for up mountains and stuff mm -hmm. so you know I that's a, that was a, a huge investment and he wasn't a professional but so a huge investment also to to go on a trip to the arctic so but what I found is you know after day two the 600 mil is not coming along anymore because yep you're almost losing balance trying to shoot in a Zodiac while you have other people and you're kind of like <laughs> in the waves and then to trek, like it's, it's a lot. So it's very much context. If you know you can drive to a location, can shoot out your window or you only have to go a few hundred meters or you're super fit and right. you've got that body strength and the situation um you know accommodates it absolutely like I, I the the results are there and if I could shoot you know everything at 2.8 I would <laughs> love it all right yeah should we move along yeah yep ah hmm. so this is an oryx in Namibia and so this is one that I was thinking of in terms of utilizing negative space. Mm. So in a couple of ways, and there are absolutely things that I would change about this image, but I will tell you um, how I shot it. So I preferably would have liked to have been lower so that that horizon line was right, not at his mouth, but mm. was actually below him sort of more around his neck uh, but I was shooting off a quad bike um, and it just happened that I came over this hill and I was on a quad bike adventure and I brought my camera with me because it's Namibia and it's amazing um, and so I was kind of balancing my camera and this uh, lens on my lap while I'm riding on this quad bike and so this is a situation where um, I framed it because he's looking in this direction. So, of course, I want to let him look into that. Mm. Um, and then I'm also wanting to give negative space above him. So, I mean, I'm not sure how accurately, certainly his head, but he's generally his body will be on one of the cross points of the rule of thirds if you start dissecting right, the picture. Right, right. Um, and... So it's essentially it's in the bottom left corner that I've put the subject and I've chosen the bottom left because he's looking to his right. So I'm allowing him to look into the photograph uh, like we talked about earlier. But this could also be quite interesting, assuming you didn't put him too far to the right, could still be a, an interesting picture if you did put him on the right and maybe in that that bottom third, uh, I want to point at the screen, but I realize you can't see where my finger is. <laughs> but if you put him in the bottom right of the, you know, of the picture um, and gave that 
sort of negative space on the left, mm -hmm. it would tell more of a story of like where, maybe where has he come from? What has been the journey prior? Mm. Whereas this, it's more like he's looking into the picture. He's looking into his future and where he's going. So, you know, there's different mm -hmm. uh, ways and uh, stories that you can tell um, by how you frame uh, your your image. And then, of course, it's uh, sunset, dusk. What I've done in camera is changed my white balance to be very, very warm. So I, a custom Kelvin, <laughs> high Kelvin number. I may have even like put it up to 8,000, maybe all the way to 10,000. Um, I don't remember, but I could check. Uh, but yeah, I've definitely gone in and manually done that to enhance the yellow and the goldenness that I'm seeing um, at that time of day, but I wanted to really like pump it up in camera. So uh, a few little things that I've tweaked, but it wasn't a situation where I could get off my vehicle. Um, and yeah, so they're definitely like, I love this image for this species and showing that negative space mm -hmm. uh but there's definitely you know in a perfect world things that i would uh right, right. <laughs> by the way do you do you use much post uh, or pretty much you try to do much of it in uh camera before i try to do as much as i can in camera okay. uh but i definitely so i shoot raw so i'm obviously ending up with an right. image that doesn't look like this it's quite a flat right. Right. Uh, right. version of this so in lightroom absolutely i'm going to pump up some vibrance and saturation that's very much my style um i usually will uh, play a little bit with curves for contrast um and then maybe sharpening some some extra sharpening if needed. I noticed that in the current versions of Lightroom, they also have kind of separated that out. So now you have texture. And so I've noticed recently I've dabbled with the texture a little bit as opposed to the sharpening. Um, mm -hmm. And that seems to, to work quite nicely. But in saying that, I, I'm, I try to be careful with, uh, post-production sharpening or those tools because I do shoot shallow and so quite often the bulk of my image will be bokeh like out of focus um, not meant to be sharp so if I start doing that too much it's going to give that areas that should be nice and creamy kind of making it a bit too rigid so um, yeah so in that case I might um, maybe do a little bit of sharpening on the subject if it needs it, but generally, um, definitely adding a bit of vibrancy and uh, and contrast with the curves. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And okay. then you know, straightening if I if I was a little off on my horizon right, stuff right. like that. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty um, I do have a um, a, a a wildlife. Uh, photography ebook and so actually in the at the end of that if people are interested I mm -hmm. screenshot my Lightroom process and just go through you know bits and pieces that I tweak um, yeah that's very nice I'm yeah. sure there's like some yeah. of the highlights and shadows I think I tweak a little bit as well so for now I mean I have a very particular style so I have a preset and uh, that I will start with when I import a shoot and then I will tweak depending on the image as needed but it, uh, anything to be as efficient as possible right, oh, right. I can imagine absolutely yeah. I can imagine yeah. I'm trying that, to get off that computer as quickly right. as possible <laughs> there is live all I want to be on. I want to be in nature <laughs> behind the camera not the laptop yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, hear you. I hear you yeah yep. all right I guess we can go to the next one I don't uh, even remember what's coming yeah. now. Uh, yeah, so Rhino again, love, love Rhino. So this is in Kenya. Uh, and again, I was very fortunate to have um, this moody sky and these this sort of storm front coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so different country to my first uh, Rhino shot, but uh, mm -hmm. similar in that the sky was quite yeah. atmospheric. Right. Um, this, I was a little further away 
And so I, I was in a safari star vehicle but I actually got on top of the roof to shoot this and laid down on the roof because Mm. um, they were up on a ridge and then it kind of fell away so usually I'm trying to get lower I'm kind of hanging out of vehicles and trying to get my gear as low as possible Uh, in this particular case not that often that I need to like actually get myself a little bit higher Uh, Mm. and just I mean to have five rhino and there were actually more than five around it's just that obviously the way these um these ones are standing and you know the way that i framed it Mm. but there were some others off in the distance to see that many rhino in one place wild and with their horns because in south africa as a means of protecting rhino from poaching they actually um cut off the ends of their horns here which like fingernails then it grows back a few few years later they have to do it again so they only cut it down to a certain point like you would a nail bed um so that you don't go into the nail bed and damage their horn um but essentially it they just kind of like have a flat they don't have a horn anymore so really tragic that that even has to be an option here uh but unfortunately if it's it's that or a poacher uh, gets to it they will kill the animal and take their whole horn while the animal is is usually still alive and it dies from that experience which is just horrific so you know I so deeply understand the importance of seeing rhino in the wild and the fact that they have their horn and the, the one on the right side has such a unique horn as well. It's, Mm. it's quite unusual to see where it goes in that direction. And the way that's happened is they like to rub their horns uh, on. So they'll find like a favorite rock or a tree stump or something, which they'll also kind of rub their body on but they rub their horn and she's obviously done it enough in a certain angle that it's directed the way, the growth of the horn. But I mean, I've never seen a horn that long. It's just incredible. Um, So yeah, this is special on so many levels, very much for the subject because it's an endangered species. Um, And I have seen and witnessed the the hardships. Um, You know, I've seen poached rhinos and unfortunately it happens around where I live so that's Mm -hmm. that's definitely not lost on me Um, but one thing I found with Kenya is the most magical skies like okay where I was it was it just consistently was amazing so for a photographer incredible Yeah. yeah So very, very special. Um, I won't say specifically where in Kenya this is, just given that it is a rhino uh, subject. And it's it's unfortunately one of the things where you'll notice, like if I post on social media, sometimes I'll post kind of a, a somewhat specific location. But if it comes to rhino, the, the closest I'll post is like the general country that it will be in sure. Uh, sure. just because you know, inadvertently you can fuel um, poachers by, I mean, everyone is on social media. So someone could come along and say, well, that's a unique horn. I want that horn in my living room or for whatever reason. Wow, yeah. And, you know, if I posted, you know, exactly where I photographed that, uh, I could be putting a target on that animal's back. It's like horrific to even think that you have to consider these things, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, by the way, yeah. a group of us are uh, uh, going in February, in February in Kenya. Uh, ah. Hopefully, everything is okay with the new variant. Yeah, I think <laughs> you're fine because okay. we in Southern Africa have been completely shut down, even though, right, I hear, um, I hear. Mm-hmm. yeah, so my understanding is South African uh, scientists discovered it, not that it was found in South Africa, but anyway, we've been banned. So all of Southern Africa is basically red listed now, although I wouldn't be surprised if that changes soon, Uh, but Kenya is not part of that. So Kenya being East Africa, it's actually quite far away uh, from us. 
Uh, so they are completely fine. So you should be fine. I have friends that literally just went there, um, uh, arrived there last week and one of also one of my favorite places on earth and, and within Africa, I mean, I love different countries for different reasons mm -hmm. and they're all so unique. Um, uh, but Kenya is like, the quintessential Africa that you think of, that you you see in movies, you know, where you've got the open plains. In South Africa, it's very different. It's a different kind of bush. We don't have vast open savanna. It's like bush. It's mm. thick and kind of patchy and very, very different. And so it has its own unique beauty. But um, Kenya and Tanzania, it is, it's, it's the Lion King, basically. It's right. everything you dream of and more, especially if, tell me you're going to the Masai Mara. Yes, we are. Yes, yes. It's for, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah point, it's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Point or yeah, two. yeah. I mean, oh man, I just want to go back there. That's yeah, funny. it's like, you know, you'll have one knob thorn tree standing in like an open area and it's just like so perfect mm -hmm. so perfect yeah you'll you'll yeah. love it well thanks for sharing we're looking for uh, i need to get back there keeping fingers crossed no problem with respect to travel restrictions yeah i think but, you'll be fine assuming yeah. you don't have to come fly to Joburg, but i'm sure i feel like by february yeah this current red list will be okay after the Christmas period oh, and everything as well. That's awesome. Very nice. Very nice. Famous last words. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard to predict. It's so hard to predict. It is. It's you know, we we just opened up and yeah. Africa in general relies so much on tourism. Sure. Um, not not just for you know the the tourist areas but in general supporting communities supporting wildlife conservation and preservation uh, habitat protection so it's you know when we when we go backwards like this it's such a huge uh, blow to so many elements mm. um, of this continent yeah. yeah hopefully back to traveling soon Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, let's let's. I think I think we have one or two more. Uh, oh my God! Where are we here? <laughs> we are in right on the border of South Africa and Namibia, mm. uh, in a in the Kalahari. Okay. Um, so so this particular region. Mm. Um, it crosses into a few countries. So you it goes from South Africa, goes into Botswana and over to Namibia. It's kind of like across those, where those three countries join is this section of um, Kalahari. And if you go into Namibia, then it's pronounced Kadahali. So it's, oh, that's a really bad explanation of how it's pronounced, forgive me. <laughs> but, but it's it's pronounced and spelled, actually spelt a different way than the part that is in South Africa. Um, so this is like right on the border where before it's got really deserty and very sparse. So we still have like that little bit of, um, you know, low bushes for this particular shot. So A, the lighting is literally my favorite combination of lighting. And that is storm building, in the background, sun hitting the foreground. And love, 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 love this combination Amazing. because it's so unique. Yeah. And yeah, and it really brings out that blue if you've got all those clouds building. Um, so I have a few different versions of this image, but this is my favorite because I specifically was waiting for all four to have their heads down because it's mm -hmm. so different to how you're used to seeing giraffe mm -hmm. and very specific to this location. So you don't have all the tall, tall trees um, and bush. So another example of how diverse um, Africa is, you know, you go from one country to the next and there's just so much variety and habitat um yeah so this uh 
it took a while. I definitely was sitting there for a while, you know, because I, I'd have a shot and like two, I've got a shot where two have head, head down, two have heads up. Um, or they're going at like all different times. And I'm like, I just really want you all with your heads down. So I definitely waited until they all uh, were doing that just to make it a bit more of a interesting and obscure yep. uh, image. Yeah. Before uh, continuing on. So I was in a, a vehicle. This Namibia is um such a beautiful and safe country uh so you can self-drive pretty much anywhere so i'm shooting this not even from like a safari vehicle i'm just shooting out the side of like my normal car um shooting out the window and like this is just literally happening in front of me so i was just driving around looking for interesting things to see it wasn't an assignment or or technically work I was just exploring the country and uh, yeah definitely a favorite and from a while ago if I remember it might be 2014 um, or 2015 somewhere around there but uh, I moved to South Africa in 2013 from Australia mm -hmm. um, so this was very much at the beginning so I was um, taking any opportunity I could to explore the countries around me and um, yeah kind of discover this beautiful, beautiful place. That was beautiful. From one amazing picture to another one, from one amazing place to another one, it's just, this can go <laughs> yeah. on. This is just paradise. I mean, <laughs> so, so many stories. <laughs> and, the, the, and I'm sure there are so many more untold. <laughs> oh, so many more, so many more. <laughs> I this could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, oh, wow. Oh. So here we... Okay. So I, I feel like now I, I referenced that other polar bear shot. And I right. probably didn't include it. I don't know. Um, this uh, also, obviously, it's it's the Arctic. Or I shouldn't say obviously because this this could be, mm. I guess, technically anywhere up north. But this. Um, was a really unique um, glacier and obviously all these birds have come in. So while kind of environmental, like I purposely wanted to frame in the, uh, like it's an interesting image if I'd have zoomed in, it was just layers of birds, mm -hmm. but I felt like, you know, the, the, the mountain behind and, uh, and sort of that, I mean, it's not mist, it's like actual cloud and the light and everything. So, yeah, I think it was, I, I'm really drawn to graphic things. And I, it's definitely because of my past as a, a graphic designer and mm -hmm. thinking in terms of layout. And um, so when I see something like this, where there's kind of graphic forms in nature, that really appeals to me. So, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Definitely. I mean, and I, and I see a lot of uh, graphic designers myself being one uh, media. Uh, this genre of photography really connects in the levels that I'm not even sure what it is, but it allows <laughs> duration. It allows for create yes. something there. Yeah. That <laughs> you know, my, uh, my whole, I mean, obviously this, this, job is so incredibly fulfilling for me because I get to be out and I see and I witness these things and then I have the creative outlet right which I I need in my life to to get to do this but the end goal is always hoping to spark some curiosity and like emotion or connection in the viewer because I want I want the viewer to be able to feel as excited or fascinated as I was getting to see that and and be there and I really that's the ultimate goal for my uh, footage and images is that I want people to be like oh you know, like connected to something. Wow, that's interesting. I want to learn more about that animal or that place or, you know, like maybe just make someone smile and mm -hmm. yeah, appreciate the beauty in this world because that's definitely what I'm feeling while I'm taking it is like, mm -hmm. wow. 
See, that's yeah. that's that's the part that I think it's important to discuss more, I believe, because it is this the very core be, uh, reason within the purpose we follow, I think. Yeah. And I think that yeah. really makes it adds a substance which uh it it really does make a difference and uh, yeah there has to be a reason right uh, that you're shooting because you know like in the beginning like i said it, it you're so focused on the technical side as you learn it right. and you know after a while it it mm -hmm. the importance of that falls away and i don't mean in terms of you know technology and and that kind of thing but that becomes intuitive of okay if i change this right. setting this is the result i'm going to get you start to know what that is doing and so essentially you know if that's keeping your focus at the beginning that's a challenge and that's very engaging part of uh, it could be a very frustrating part of photography but it's certainly engaging but eventually like i said that falls away so if you don't have another reason for for doing it other than oh, what does this do and does that equal and this does there has to be something else like there has to be um i feel like an emotional reward for why you're doing it and usually that's going to come down to what your subject is and so obviously for me that's wildlife like if i'd have seen this scene i might have taken a picture if there were no birds there, I might have said, okay, that's really interesting with the graphic forms and maybe taken a picture. But for me, it's like, wow, all those birds. I wonder why they're all there. And it's so funny, mm -hmm. they're all lined mm -hmm. up and they're all doing this and that and everyone's busy doing something. You know, that's the part that excites me and engages me. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be able to combine those passions of having this creative outlet and the passion of wildlife, for me, that's the ultimate is being able to combine those two and then to be able to make a living out of it is just that's, you know, that, yep. fantastic and amazing. Absolutely. If I couldn't make a living out of it, I'd still be yeah. doing it um, because I would need that fulfillment from those elements. And before I discovered photography, I fulfilled those elements of my life separately. And so my creative mm -hmm. outlet was as a graphic designer and I volunteered working with wildlife and um, you know being around animals as much as I possibly could put myself. So by the time I discovered photography in my mid twenties, I was kind of like, wow, I can put these two things together. And it's like, I didn't really know that was an option or realize that before. So yeah, it's a beautiful thing if you can make a living and a career out of out of something that you're passionate about. And I Absolutely. feel like that will show through in your work. Absolutely. And thank you hoping, for taking it to this level. It does. I'm I'm most grateful for you taking it to this level because I think this is where the purpose uh the yeah. root of our purpose and the desire to do this and and uh, share and acknowledge and, yeah. and learn from each other and give back i think it really makes a difference when all comes together and and you are putting it beautifully so uh, thank you for oh, that thank you. Uh, one picture at a time i must say they just they're all puzzles <laughs> coming in such a way <laughs> uh, awesome i, I tried to i tried to choose some variety as well yeah to keep everyone uh engaged because i wanted to revisit some different places different species yeah. different colors yeah all the things that i enjoy about uh you know photography and being in the moment that's right so what else is our in our box here magic box oh Oh. Here's another. You do so bad this fighting. Is I see the bad fighting is something that you play that you are uh, yes. that, that you're interested. Love, yeah, love some backlighting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this particular situation. So this was in February this year. Mm -hmm. So also another recent shoot, and uh, I was on foot, and so I had a lot of flexibility in my movements. This cheetah. Um, and there were a few cheetah 
sort of in this area, they did not care who mm. I was, where I was. They just got on with life. And that is so perfect for a wildlife photographer mm. because I don't want to interfere with their behavior. Um, so I want them to just be natural and hopefully I can capture it. And if I'm around long enough, then I have some really nice lighting as well. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this was, I, I don't actually, I feel like it maybe was early morning, but I can't remember. I, I'm not sure if that's like dew on the grass, very possibly, but mm -hmm. I spent a week in this area out every morning and every afternoon with, with these cats. So it's all blurring into one, but I did manage to get, uh, a lot of oh and I did include it actually I have uh, another cheetah shot coming up mm -hmm. with a rainbow in the background pretty sure I put that in um, because let me check yes I did and I did include oh, there's still a few more to come I just had a quick peek um, so maybe I should like wrap it up but yeah essentially uh, so I'm pretty sure it was early morning I was able to move around like I said so I was able to get not only backlit shots, but actually, you know, shots where the sun was behind me so I could see more of the cat. So this is where it's like this ideal scenario where I get to make a variety. I, you can see I'm quite low. I'm crouching down. I have that grass in front of me. I did some shots where I was a little bit higher or I moved where there wasn't so much grass in front of me. I have so many photographs from, from this shoot and it was uh, specifically testing a, a lens out. So mm -hmm. um, that was the, the focus for this assignment is, is um, this specific lens. Uh, yeah, so I during the course of this week in the area that I was in, I had so much variety of weather that it was amazing that I've got so many shots. I, beautiful blue skies and then we had a storm come in and then I've got rainbows and like this kind of like early morning stuff I had overcast just the gamut of everything within this one week that kind of allowed me to get so much variety um, so yeah that was very very fortunate because again we're at the mercy of the weather and the light and trying to make the best of it and as a wildlife photographer you're kind of juggling that with position and the limitations most often of um, line of sight, uh, perhaps, you know, if the animal is potentially dangerous or too skittish, that determines mm -hmm. how close and position or how much you can move around. Um, and then, of course, you have a subject that's, that's usually moving um, and you have to find that line of where you're presence interferes with that animal and know it like learning where that boundary is and not going over it so there's all these factors as a wildlife uh, photographer that come into it to make a shot so you know I could photograph a static object as a silhouette in this scene mm -hmm. and have you know absolutely be able to recreate it but it's for me it's a subject it's that it's this beautiful wild cheetah and it's like surveying its domain and you know kind of starting its day so yeah absolutely and I love a good silhouette absolutely. and backlighting yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> and especially where you know it's hitting the grass in front of it and you know all the little things I took a series of shots so uh, when it comes to choosing a particular image it will very much come down to, um, you know, she, it's obviously walking. So at this point, because I have a, a few different shots that are going to be exposed the same way, probably, you know, angled the same way, what's coming down to the choice is the fact that her mouth was open briefly mm -hmm. and also where her legs are in position. Um, so, you know, if I end up with multiple similar shots, there are definitely factors that are going to come into play that'll make me choose one over the other. And it's very much usually body position or behavior mm -hmm. um, or eye contact, if that's something that I'm going for and have, then, you know, that's really going to connect with a viewer 
versus a shot that maybe it's just looking off, you know, if you've got the option right. of, I'm going to pick the eye contact, obviously. So, yeah. But yeah, there is, there's a few more coming, but the next shot is actually the one I referenced before. Yes. So this is iPhone shot right. out of, out of, um, purely out of necessity. Mm. I had a long lens on me. I was at the top of the ship, so I was quite high. And so while I did have wider lenses with me, I, I think I had the 150 to 600 with me and even 150, it was just getting too much for what I wanted to show. And I felt like if I ran all the way back to the other side of the ship, went to my cabin, got the other lens, by the time I came back, this would not obviously be here anymore. Right, right. Um, he, he was still there, but he wasn't in this position. Right. <laughs> so this was very much a putting my camera down, getting out my phone and taking a few shots um, specifically to show the angle that I was seeing mm -hmm. and the different layers of ice, um, you know, and the, the pack ice and the cracks and different things. So, yeah, definitely um, uh, a, a popular image and so a testament to the best camera is the one you have with you. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Always. <laughs> So glad we found this. Uh, yeah, definitely. You uh, you you did reference it at at, uh, at the you know at the first yeah. air shot. That's beautiful. All right, the and the I, rainbow. Rainbow. Yeah. So in this this scene, um, it had actually been a really like overcast, gloomy. It had been raining. Mm -hmm. There was no color prior to this, and the sun was hidden. But, you know, I went out anyway, and this, this cheetah was actually searching for her, uh, she has two cubs. And they're not tiny, tiny, but they're big enough that um, they will follow her around. And um, for whatever reason, they've been separated. So she was actually, um, she's got her mouth open here. She was actually calling for them. Mm. Um, and so she's specifically like looking around and searching for her cubs and they were not within earshot. So they were far away. Um, so this was a huge area uh, expanse. And I think what had happened is there was, there's another uh, group of cheetah males uh, in this area. And I think they've crossed paths and it's been a bit of a um, tense situation mm. and they've been split up during that. And so she's then had all night where she hasn't found them. And so she's constantly moving about and calling for them. And I spent all that time with her. Uh, wow. And it turns out the cubs were like far, far away. So they couldn't hear her calling. Um, so she's on like a high kind of ridge at the moment. And she did find them the next morning, just so everyone oh, is sorry. like, has like a, <laughs> a finish to that story, so happy ending. <laughs> They're fine, which is great. Um, but it made for really interesting behavior because she was very, very focused. She's very much looking and calling. And it's a very specific call. So, mm. um, you know, cheetah in particular, uh, they can't uh, roar like other big cats, they don't have um, a part of their uh, throat that is needed for that. So right. they actually chirp. They sound a bit like a bird. They chirp uh, and kind of squeak. And so there are different ways that that comes out depending on what they're trying to convey. Um, so she was very much doing like a, where are you kind of call. Uh, and it was beautiful. But this moment where the sun behind me mm. kind of just peeked through and this rainbow I have a few different uh, formats and mm. my favorite image I actually is a vertical shot and I've positioned so I've photographed this and then I've moved across right of frame so mm. that the rainbow ended up right behind her and I have a vertical shot of that but I wanted to focus on um, landscape shots only to sort of make use of this format with the, the screen. Uh, I just thought it'd be easier than sort of flipping between verticals and horizontals. Um, but yes, I definitely have, and my favorite shot is where I've moved into position and I'm shooting as I go. So I've got, 
out of focus shots. I've got all the things because I'm literally like, <gasps> she's going to walk over this ridge and she's gone. It's done. Like that is my, my cheetah with a rainbow opportunity gone. I am shooting everything while I'm moving right. and positioning. And even if I'm not in the right position, I am shooting it all. So there's definitely a, a few options, but my, what I wanted was to get into the position where this rainbow is right behind her. And thankfully I did before she went because she literally just kind of looked, I mm -hmm. go over and then she walked over and yeah. that was done. Um, but yeah, this is sort of right at the beginning. So I'm shooting quite wide uh, and I'm still approaching. So I'm like, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss right. it. I'm shooting and make sure I want to get that, that rainbow in. Um, and then as, as I approached and was able to really decisively position myself, mm -hmm. then I started to frame it a uh, different way. So like I said, I, I have some vertical shots. I've got some different horizontal ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I definitely. One, one thing that works so well, I think, in this frame as well is the ju uh, juxtaposition between the cheetah and uh, the rainbow, the harmonious, I mean, the way it just so happened to be in the frame. Yes, and this is a perfect everything. example. Mm -hmm. Perfect example of like that tension that comes with the fact yes. that she's looking out of frame. So if there was no rainbow, my default is to frame her on the left of this picture. Mm -hmm. But of course, sure. if I yeah, did that, I'm not right. getting the rainbow in. So it's like a forced situation where I do still consciously frame it. So I want to give her some space to look into. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to have her like almost hitting the edge because then right. there's like this tension that the viewer is like, this doesn't work for some reason. It's like, this is why. Mm -hmm. So, but it's still, I feel like, you know, your eye will naturally travel left to right. And so you're going sort of rainbow right. and then down to her and then kind of follow her eye line out of frame where you can kind of wonder, well, what is she actually looking at? Because the amazing rainbow is that way, uh, but it's actually that she's calling for her babies um, and not knowing where they are. So she does not give a crap about this rainbow. She is on a mission. <laughs> so she's very much focused yeah. on what she's doing. So yeah. Um, Let's see if we have another one. Oh, yes. Might even oh. Be a couple more. Oh, I okay. love it. So, I, every single one is a wow. I got so many shots this February. So obviously I had to throw a few in. Um, so this is the same cheetah as the silhouette. Okay. So this is showing you that I've positioned around to where the light is on the body. Um, and then I. it's a little a little bit later, but still very, very early. Mm. Um, so lit nicely, like in terms of like showing her body pattern and her face and the catch light in the eyes. Um, and of course I framed it this way where I haven't gone with a whole lot of negative space the way that I framed it, but I'm still framing it in a way to let her look sort of out yeah. and across. So she's, I have, I mean, what a great model. Like she was looking around <laughs> yeah, and here really she's did. obviously yes. calling, calling again. So I have photos with eye contact. I have photos where she's looking this way, that way, like fantastic. Um, but yeah, this one in particular and this black and white conversion. So I always shoot raw, which means I shoot color always. And so all of my black and whites, I will do the conversion right. post-production. Right. Um, and so I just love the lighting in this one and, and how light and airy the grass is. And so we really get a sense of her spots and her pattern and that beautiful, um, the black tear lines, which are quintessential cheetah. And, you know, the fact that, like I said, I also have photos of her kind of looking in different ways, also without calling. Um, so for me, this gives the photo, um, it makes it a little bit more dynamic because she's, she's mid movement, she's mid action. And that is 
she's clearly standing still in this particular case, but she's in a moment of calling. So yeah, that was sort of the deciding factor over this same photo with her mouth closed. You know, it's a little bit more engaging um, in terms of behavior and it's obviously behavior, nice right? More behavior, right? as a viewer to be able to see her, her um, it's almost like bringing a, a way to bring a still image to life that she's not yes. just frozen, that there's a little bit, you know, of life in there. Um, and that's one of the things as a filmmaker, I get to, one of the great things is that I get to film sequences and behavior and show that. So the, the outcome of still images is sort of the same triggering of emotion but you have to do it in a different way mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely and all of that really why. comes to life when once you see this but it's it's a treat to have uh the creator to talk <laughs> yeah about all of the emotions that you actually go through and it's quite amazing and this is still very very fresh in my mind ah yeah okay yeah yeah all right oh. I think I, I think I ended on this one. I'm gonna, yeah, I think yep. so. yeah. Okay, so this is the last image. I had to put a reptile in because, you know, finish uh, with a reptile because I love reptiles. Uh, so another environmental style shot. Another, again, a couple of things, like if I'm being really critical that I would um, mm -hmm. change, but I guess in context of how this photograph was taken um, is one of the favorite things about it. And I probably should have put a behind the scenes shot in here, but a uh, wide angle shot. I shot this with the Nikon 17 uh, to 35. So, and it was at 17. So it was very, very close. Um, so even though I have been this close to Komodos and since, and I filmed them and had them, come up and licking my my lens and different mm. things it's generally not a good idea to get that low and close oh, okay so okay. what i've actually done oh wow <laughs> i've i've built a contraption where um so i've got uh, the camera on like a little makeshift like a base plate which is attached to some wheels off of a toy car so big kind of ruggedy wheels with a base plate and then attached a boom, like a pole to it and set it up with a remote trigger. So basically I just have this thing on a pole and I'm rolling it around on two wheels and then I'm triggering when I want to take a photo. Very cool, I see. So, yeah. yeah, so that was quite a fun way to do it. So uh, I didn't have a screen. Um, I couldn't see how I was framing the shot. I was just kind of guessing as I went. So hence, if I'd have physically been looking through a viewfinder, I would have consciously uh, not trimmed the, the claws. Uh, and also I would have slightly positioned so the tree wasn't physically touching um, his neck in frame. Like literally a few millimeters of movement would completely shift where that tree is in relation to his body or in his neck. So definitely things that I would do if I was actually like decisively making the composition and, and choosing it. But uh, certainly as a species, it has a fun kind of very rudimentary contraption of things kind of created like together to build this thing. And also uh, for me, the saliva hanging down, which is yeah. just quintessential Komodo dragon. Yeah, love them so much. So indeed. yeah, I thought that would be a fun one to end on. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. <laughs> I'll uh, I hit stop share for a moment. Okay, so we're back. Um, I wanna thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for doing this. Uh, you opened the door to a journey full of perspectives. And to me, oh, it's been extremely enriching. And I'm sure for everybody else who'll see this, it's uh, there's so much um, you know, to learn and to think about. Uh, really, like to me, I, I, I know I'm going to come back uh, to a, a, lot, a lot of moments that we discussed that uh, I think it's important mm. as we try to uh, 
dive into deeper within respect to our uh, to our passion. Like to me, for example, wildlife photography yeah. really is that way to balance life. And it's, it is important to find ways which usually are within you um, mm. to uh, connect in and with other people because they help you see things differently. And then you find your yeah. self. And, and I think this interview really kind of like depicted and manifested that among so many other things, thanks to your experience and uh, amazing uh, self. So thank you so much for being part of oh, my talks. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually so nice to be able to share the context of these images mm. because, you know, when I share on social media, I do like to include the camera settings um, yeah. because when I first started learning, I very much poured over those details um, as I was learning. But it's just a part of the story. And, you know, those settings, while they do tell you a little bit, they tell you nothing about the context of why the settings were chosen because you could still get a perfect exposure with a different combination of settings. So it's so nice to be able to not just share, you know, the stories and bring back some really nice memories of these moments, but, but also like the context of perhaps why I've chosen to shoot in a certain way, uh, because that's generally not something that, uh, that I can share with those settings. So yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, all the best and uh, love to stay in touch. You'll, you'll, you'll see me on Instagram. I'll share this interview, of course. So all the best and thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it.